We turn to the New Testament for a second reading of Scripture to the Gospel of John, chapter 4. And we will read the first 30 verses. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. And it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink, for his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman, of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou would, wouldst have asked of him that he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, Thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go. Call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidst thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. 
And upon this came his disciples and marvelled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. The words of the Lord Jesus Christ to the woman at the well. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That is our text. Um, we'll come to it in due course. But just now, we sang some words from Psalm 2, which I asked you to look out for. And um, if you did look at them and think about them, I guess you will have thought them very interesting, but puzzling, uh, challenging maybe frightening, really frightening to the point of being deeply disturbing if we actually dwell on them and take them seriously. They are verses 11 and 12 to refresh our memories. We sang, Serve God in fear and see that ye join trembling with your mirth. Kiss ye the sun, lest in his ire ye perish from the way if once his wrath begin to burn, blessed all that on him stay. And the scripture equivalent is naturally no less awe-inspiring, being the source of the metrical psalm. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. And they're sobering words, aren't they? Uh, when you do stop and dwell upon them. Uh, notice uh, that they, there's two things about them really. Notice that uh, they offer no choice to humanity about how we worship God. And they certainly do not offer us any choice about whether we worship God. The only choice is, will we worship him in love, in the way that pleases him, and receive a blessing, or will we, well, <laughs> there's no easy way to say this, is the, will we actually perish from the way, that is, um, be removed from the way, meaning not be counted as his which is, of course, an eternal death sentence, for there is no other way to salvation, that is. As Peter said to the Son of God when asked by him if he was going to turn from the way like the others in John 6, 68, Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Christ is the only way, the only hope, and those who... Uh, I perish from that way, are without hope. So the question of the worship of our God and how it should be practised may well be more important to humanity than any other question ever in the history of the entire universe. But what is just as disconcerting is that when people sing or read such words, we often don't notice them, do we? We just sing through them. And, um, or if, we're, if they're pointed out to us, we, we look at them, uh, I suppose, a bit like those words sometimes, if you've ever been prescribed drugs from the, the doctor, and if you ever dare to read that little bit of paper inside, and it's a, it, it lists all the terrible side effects of the medication that you've been given, warnings, 
um, which you obviously ignore because everybody knows that the manufacturers only put them in to cover, it, cover themselves and in actuality there's no real danger at all, so you ignore them. And uh, is it like this with these words of Psalm 2? Only the difference is, of course, Psalm 2 is not produced by a human drugs manufacturer. It is the word of God, which never lies and contains no mistakes. It should be taken seriously. So why, we may ask, are irreverent worshippers not struck down all the time like Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu in Numbers 2661 when they uh, presumptuously offered unauthorised fire in worship to the Lord? Because the Lord, says Psalm 103 verse 8, as we sang, is slow to anger and plenteous in mercy two of the many reasons why he deserves to be worshipped in love, obedience and fear. But it is not a good idea at any rate to take liberties and presume confidently upon that mercy lasting forever. No good will come of it in the end when his patience uh, with the rebellious and the disrespectful finally runs out. But where can we go when we have seen and read and sung and understood these warnings as in Psalm 2, to make sure that we are pleasing the Lord with our worship and not disrespecting him and not trying his patience to breaking point, and that not merely out of fear for our own safety, but because we love him for his goodness and we want to please him. Well, where can we go but to Scripture, his own words given to us in mercy, so that we may know his wishes and obey them. For obedience to God's wishes in the way we worship, the way we worship must be the first step, as, as King Saul was told in that passage we read from 1 Samuel 15 just now. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the word of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. The Son of God himself, referred to by the prophecy in Psalm 2.12, which we just sang, as the one who deserves and expects our love and worship, will, through his own living word tell us how to worship because he is not trying to catch us out. Um, he's not willing that any should perish, says in Second Peter 3, 9. Uh, he tells us all we need to know in his word about how we should worship. And uh, so we must endeavor by the help of the Holy Spirit to unpack his instructions and um, which we, for which we will turn to in our New Testament, to John 4, if you, if you close this, if you open it at John 4, we're going to have a look at that passage, and where we see the Son himself now in the form of a man, gently speaking to the woman at the well about the acceptable way to worship God. Uh, yes, God's word always gives us exactly what we need uh, in order to be saved in the first place, and then to advance in the knowledge and love of the Saviour after that. So here are his own words once again, verses 23 and 24 of the chapter. They'll be our main text tonight, taking what we have gleaned from Psalm 2 as a, a sort of introduction. And we will look at these words as closely as time allows, letting the scripture of John 4, 23 and 24 interpret the scripture of Psalm 2 verses 11 and 12. So to repeat our text, John 4, 23 and 24, the words of Jesus to the woman at the well, Behold, the hour cometh, and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. 
So what is the meaning of the first words in our text? But the hour cometh, and now is. What does that mean? Something important must have occurred at this point, mustn't it, for Jesus to say those words. The words of the Saviour indicate that it must be something very significant, for it changes everything, obviously now, in regard to how God should be worshipped from that point on. What had happened? Well, the answer to that question, which the woman in the well at the well must have been puzzling over, uh, was actually standing right in front of her, uh, the son himself of Psalm 2.12. Christ the Lord had arrived in the flesh and was talking to her, and nothing would ever be the same again. His arrival itself among humanity, of course, being that momentous event. The hour cometh and now is. Uh, from this moment, the era of the Old Testament, with all its detailed laws for the worship of God, was ending. It was now over. It was fulfilled. Uh, the system of the priesthood and the ceaseless slaughtering of sheep for human sins was in its last moments. It had served its purpose, which was to point ahead and alert the chosen people of God, at least those of them who were spiritually alive and awake, um, to the approaching final sacrifice which the Son had come to make of himself at Calvary, the sacrifice which would actually wash away the sins of his own people in a way that the blood of sheep could only symbolise. And this is confirmed by the scripture in places like Hebrews 10.4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Or Psalm 50 verse 13, where God asks, will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? When all is said and done, what use are dead animals to the eternal God? The hour cometh and now is. So that time is still in force today. Nothing has changed it since then. No more sacrifices of animals, for we have the son of Psalm 2.12, who voluntarily suffered and laid down his life to pay for his people's sins. He conquered death and hell for us so that we might be spared. The price he paid in love is quite beyond our comprehension and our worth, and he has the perfect right to expect the kiss of loyalty and worship for what he has done for his people. And he also has the right to be angry when greeted with ingratitude and disrespect and unbelief by those who are not his people and will not bow their knee to the rightful king. That is the momentous change that Jesus is referring to in his opening words of our text. The hour cometh and now is. Nothing has ever been the same since he came, nor will it ever go back to how it was before he came. The Old Testament system of worship is finished, not thrown away, but fulfilled having served its purpose in pointing to him. So we move on to the next words of our text. When the true worshippers, the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers, which is a phrase, isn't it, which clearly implies that there are worshippers who are not true worshippers uh, of God. Why would anybody want to worship God untruly. Wouldn't that be a complete waste of time? Answer, yes, a complete waste of time. So why would anybody do it? But in fact, many do it. Many have always done it because uh, well, to be charitable, they're spiritually asleep and their motivation is entirely of this world. But it is still a complete waste of time because in this world, they are investing all their effort and it is passing away. Their reasons, maybe many, um, 
from pagan in origin to placate the gods, as it were, uh, to try to ensure prosperity and success, or maybe to gain advancement in society. Uh, that was more obvious maybe in, in past ages than it is now when the church, such as it was, was very powerful. And if you wanted to get on in society, it was advantageous if you held a high office in the church at the time. But even now, of course, a discreet whisper that a, that a politician goes to church, uh, so long as it's not overdone, can gain trust and votes from, from a target group in the electorate who may be deluded into thinking that this politician is therefore not quite as untrustworthy as the others, yet other untrue worshippers are motivated by pure emotion, uh, for human beings always like it when they, they feel a sense of peace inside them or well-being. Others may worship because they are brought up to it from childhood and the, inhabit, the habit has now become ingrained. Other people worship automatically, uh, repeating prayers by rote without thinking, maybe counting them off on a, a string of beads to keep track of where they're up to. Still others uh, will go to church to get a place for their child in a church school, which is deemed to provide a better education. But as soon as the child is in, the family falls away from church attendance. There's all sorts of reasons for untrue worship. <laughs> All pointless, actually worse than pointless, worse than a waste of time because they are, um, all, they are um, not doing anything where it counts eternally for in spiritual things. They're testing God's patience and, and storing up trouble for themselves on the day of reckoning. But the true worshippers will worship in spirit and in truth. Uh, so that's the last words of our text, which mercifully introduce a more positive note. The Son, Jesus Christ the Lord, speaks about the sort of worship which is acceptable and pleasing in the sight of God. And it is worship in spirit and in truth. We'll take the in spirit first, as our King James Bible translates it. Some churches... Um, uh, maybe of the charismatic or the Pentecostal persuasion, take this as meaning in the spirit. Uh, their preferred NIV translation inserts a the and a capital S on spirit so that it can be taken as referring to the Holy Spirit. It, we don't normally quote the NIV here, but it says... Um, in the NIV, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. Um, so as a result, of course, um, these churches feel able to refer to their lives and their churches and their worship as spirit-filled, especially as proved by things like speaking in tongues and prophesying and, and miraculous healings, which they always like to point to in their meetings. But the other possible meaning is that spirit should have a small s and no the in front of it, as you can see in our King James Bibles, because it is referring to the human spirit as contrasted with the physical human body. If the King James Bible is right, that would mean that Christ the Lord is saying that true and acceptable worship of God in spirit will not be all about our bodies, all about our old earthly natures being given free reign to indulge themselves, meaning things like preachers should not regard it as their aim to entertain their listeners and, and make them laugh and cry by turns so that they go home saying, wow, what a preacher, what a sermon, instead of giving the glory to the Saviour and thanking God for his goodness. People leading in public prayers should be speaking exclusively to the Lord and not be trying to impress their human listeners with the depth of their own spirituality. Musicians should not be giving in to the temptation to choose tunes and, and music because they showcase their own skills and talents. And of course, in this church, we don't have 
musicians in that, well, we do, we sing just from the Psalms because we're aware of this danger of this. Um, but uh, where if anyone's listening in who goes to a church where they have music groups and how easy it is, isn't it, for that, for that to, um, the musicians to choose things that appeal to the, the earthly nature of the worshippers and, and show off how clever they are. Ministers should not be aiming to lure um, the worldly into their services with novelties and compromises so that the numbers go up and up and up and take the minister's ego sky high with them. People, the people should not be coming to worship for what they can get out of it and staying away if they don't reckon there will be much to be got. And dear brothers and sisters in Christ, please don't think that anybody is personally being got at here or that any individual has been noticed as being guilty. All of us human beings, we, whatever contribution we make to church life and however we worship the Lord, we've all got to be aware, haven't we, of these temptations, for we still have our earthly natures inside us trying to snatch the steering wheel of our lives away from our born-again spirits and point us in the direction of gratification and satisfaction and feeling good about ourselves. Anyway, to return to the point, Worship in spirit with no the and no capital S, meaning the human spirit, or worship in the spirit with uh, the and a capital S, meaning the Holy Spirit. Which one does the master mean? From the point of view of the original Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, there is no clear way to decide because the manuscripts were all written in block capital letters with no gaps between the words and no punctuation. So deciding between a small or a capital S on the English word spirit has to go with sense. The original Greek may not help us to decide, but a knowledge of ourselves as human beings does, doesn't it? For which kind of worship does the old fallen earthly nature like? Emotive, foot tapping music, entertaining talks, razzmatazz, novelty, excitement and fun. Does it prefer that or does it prefer the word of God presented plain and unvarnished with the absolute minimum of attention being given to the feel good factor which the old fallen nature so much craves? Well, we don't really even have to think about it, do we, um, to see which one is the answer. We know what the answer is. It's one of the reasons we stick to our King James Bible, even though the crowds in the modern and user-friendly churches do not understand why, when they've long since thrown it out and they're obviously flourishing. The master tells us that the worship God is looking for is in spirit. That is not in the flesh, not with the old nature in charge. And in truth, which is clear to understand, in truth means honestly and without hypocrisy. As it always does, the opposite of the Pharisees in Matthew 23, who make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feasts, and who Luke 18, um, 11 tells us like particularly to pray on street corners, presumably so that they could be seen and admired from more than one direction. It's easy to understand that this is not worshipping God in spirit and in truth, and indeed it is not worshipping God at all. No good offering him that kind of stuff and thinking he will be pleased with it. So how can all these threads be drawn together in a simple, practical and helpful conclusion? How do we obey the Saviour and ensure that we are worshipping in spirit and in truth when our old fallen nature is so devious and so determined? How can we escape from something which is actually inside ourselves and is still part of us, at least until we arrive in the kingdom and Christ's work in us is completed? 
Well, we turn to scripture again for the answer to finish off with Romans 12, 1, which you may know off by heart, where the Lord gives us the pointer we are looking for through the inspired pen of Paul. We silence the old nature, the fallen earthly part of us, by sacrificing it. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, sacrifice hurts, of course, and we might guess that the old nature, the body, as Paul calls it here, will not want to be sacrificed. It will sense immediately what is intended and will pull back, bleating pitifully, or if that doesn't work, it will kick and struggle. Uh, but it has to be done if we are to obey God's word. How is it to be done? Well, there is the clue right at the end of Romans 12.1 in the words, reasonable service. We apply reason every time we worship the Lord. Simple, mechanical steps. We take them to keep the old nature out of it. We won't go through that long, wearisome list again of all the different contributions people make to church life because it's unnecessary. We, each one of us, know, don't we, inside, um, in our own case, deep down, what we have to do. Every time we feel our old nature stirring inside us, when it comes to worshipping God, we sacrifice it. Every time it makes a suggestion, we know that suggestion must be wrong or it would not be making it. How do we know which suggestions are coming from it? They are the suggestions which would result in it being uh, pleased with itself, it being thanked, it being boosted up. And so every time it pops up, we sacrifice it. We are born again. We have a new nature now in Christ, by God's grace, as well as an old nature, we can live by the new nature and sacrifice the old by an act of decision every time it pops up with an idea of what could be done to worship the Lord. Uh, that would um, be good fun or novel or anything like that. Every time, reasoned, practical steps to stop the old nature stealing the worship due to God for itself. And then when we do that, when we've got rid of everything that pleases the old nature, then what is left will be worship in spirit and in truth. Worship life of our church. Amen. We stand to pray. <laughs> Our loving Heavenly Father, we ask as we leave this thy house here to forgive us our sins and wash us clean in the Saviour's blood and to make us more and more like our Saviour by the, thy Holy Spirit's action in our life and to hasten the day of our Saviour's return. And a final blessing lifted from 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. <laughs>